Well, the, the answer actually has already been expressed to us, uh, and, no, and, and actually it's kind of ironic because uh, one of the uh, founders who wrote about this is Alexander Hamilton. And if you recall, with your studying of, of history, Alexander Hamilton was one of the founders who actually proposed a national government. And throughout the Constitutional Convention, he became very frustrated because he realized that the people would, and, and, the, and the other men who were at the convention were not going to accept a nationalized government, that they insisted upon a separation of powers, of co-equal powers of the states and the federal government. So Alexander Hamilton was that kind of person, but this is what Alexander Hamilton said in the Federalist Papers. He said that the states would be the natural guardians of freedom for their citizens. He said that if the federal government ever decided that it would usurp its powers and encroach upon the powers of the people and the powers of the state, that the state govern governments would be not only the voice, but also the arm of their discontent, meaning the people's discontent. So what does that mean? What is the voice and the arm? Well, in context of what he was saying was they would be not only the voice through legislation and through acts of, of diplomacy, but they would also be the arm, meaning the, act, the physical defense of their states. Now, if one of the most nationalistic minded founders said that in 1787 about our federal constitution, then where comes the notion today that the states are powerless to do anything against the federal encroachments today? When he wrote that, was he simply trying to get the states to ratify it so that they could bait you and switch you after you ratified the constitution? Or did it have, did it have actual meaning when he said it? Well, we can only presume that it had actual meaning when he said it, and that what he said actually reflects what their intentions were, that is the framers' intentions were, when they drafted this Constitution. This flies in the face of what we know today. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm not sure if you're aware of what's going on, but we are in so much trouble right now in our country that if we don't start using this power that we have in our Constitution, the state sovereignty power, my personal opinion, I think you're treading water. I think you're wasting time because the people in Washington have proven that they do not represent us. They have proven to us time and time again that their agenda is something other than protecting the rights that you read in the printout that was handed to us in your, in your table there. There's a blue printout that shows us just some of the rights some of the truths that we accepted in 1787 and prior in our country. That rights come from God. That these rights are unalienable. The right to life, the right to happiness, the right to property, the right to be free from government, governmental intrusion without your consent. It's called the consent of the governed. It's also called self-government. What we see today is the complete opposite of self-government. What we see today is a government for the government, by the government, and of the government. And we are simply their mere subjects. And the federal government, government not only treats us that way, but they treat the states that way. And we have become so, so pushed down, so oppressed, that it is any wonder that we still have any semblance of freedom in this country today. But ladies and gentlemen, that freedom will not last if we do not once again reclaim these principles that made us free to begin with. A country cannot stand without being educated. A country cannot stand without having virtue. And a country cannot stand unless it have the courage to act upon those things that we know to be true. So, my appeal to you today, my address to you today, is that when you think of the Constitution Party, and when you think of what can this party do to help reclaim freedom in this country, I think you have to start with the Tenth Amendment and with what 
it was designed to do. Its design was to do exactly what we are here today for, and that is to preserve freedom in this country. We look around us today, and I think you can see that not all of the people of the states are really concerned about doing what I'm, what I'm suggesting here today. Most people in a lot of states are still wanting the federal government to come in and bail them out of their problems. That's not going to create freedom. It's only going to create more tyranny. It is going to be only through the 10th Amendment and through working through your state governments and ensuring and, and actually demanding that your state legislators and that your governors and that your sheriffs take their oath to the Constitution seriously. Because the oath to the Constitution doesn't just mean the federal government. It necessarily means state governments. It necessarily means state governments. When we created the Constitution, we did not get rid of the state governments. We required them to be um, sovereign states. And that's very significant for days such as this. I think we need to do what Hamilton said, even though Hamilton may not realize what he was saying, whatever he said, that the states need to be the voice of the arms. But he also went on to say that it shouldn't be just one state, but it should be all the states that rally together and who have a common defense against the tyranny that is being oppressed upon the people. So whenever you think about candidates of the Constitution Party, when you think about who are you going to support, I certainly hope that you begin to think about what position can these people be put in on a state level so that we can once again, from the people up, reclaim these principles of freedom that we so cherish, that God gave us at his creation, the laws of nature and nature's God, as Thomas, Thomas Jefferson said. And I think we need to do what Thomas Paine said in his book, Common Sense, and that is we need to put away these methods that have been proven so ineffectual and so fruitless over the years. You know, there was a time before the Declaration of Independence was signed when there were so many people who were wanting to maintain this cordial relationship between the colonies and Great Britain. And they said, oh, the relationship is salvageable. They still want to be our friends. They still want, they're still trying to help us. Yeah, they may be oppressing us a little bit here and there, but they're still our friends. And Thomas Paine said, look, you either make the decision right now that you're going to choose freedom or you're going to choose the same path that you've been choosing over the years and you will live as slaves. And thank God that they made the choice to end it right then. And they, they declare their independence under God as the judge of the universe to say that we have the right to be free. And I hope and pray that the people in this audience will take this message of freedom wherever they go and that they will spread it to their friends, to their family, to their local and state governments, and that once again, we will have statesmen and stateswomen in our country. Thank you very much.